thing ministers say in cases of this kind. A few ordinary platitudes will do. <laughs> Mr. Seabury, you were... You cannot be serious in making me such a proposition. I'm quite serious. Uh, pray, allow me to believe that you are not. But I am. And if you do what I ask, I will pay you very handsomely. Pay me? Yes. I'm afraid I don't understand what you mean. Oh. How disappointing. And I came all the way from Vienna in order that you should thoroughly understand me. I fear I don't. Sir Robert, you are a man of the world. You have your prize, I suppose. If you will allow me, I will call your carriage for you. You've lived so long abroad, Mrs. Cheverly, that you seem unable to realize that you are talking to a man... To a man who laid the foundation of his fortune by selling to a stock exchange speculator a cabinet secret. What do you mean? I mean that I know the origin of your wealth and your career. And I've got your letter, too. What letter? The letter that you wrote to Baron Arnheim when you were Lord Radley's secretary, telling the Baron to buy Suez Canal shares. A letter written three days before the government announced its own purchase. It is not true. You thought the letter had been destroyed, or how foolish of you. It's in my possession. The affair to which you allude was no more than, than a speculation. The House of Commons had not yet passed the bill. It might have been rejected. It was a swindle, Sir Robert. Let us call things by their proper names. It makes everything simpler. And now, I am going to sell you that letter. And the price that I ask is your public support of the Argentine scheme. You made your fortune out of one canal. You must help me and my friends make ours out of another. I cannot do what you ask. You mean you cannot help doing it. It's not for you to make terms, Sir Robert, but for you to accept them, supposing you refuse. What then? What then? Oh, my dear Sir Robert. Oh, you will be ruined, of course. Well, scandals used to lend charm, or at least interest, to a man. Oh, but nowadays they crush him. And this is... Uh, a very nasty scandal. You could never survive it. You'll be handed out of public office. Oh, and besides, why should you sacrifice your whole future rather than deal diplomatically with your enemy? And for the moment, I am your enemy. I admit it. <laughs> Years ago, you did a clever, unscrupulous thing. It was a great success. You owe to it your fortune and your position. Well, now you've got to pay for it. But what you ask is impossible. But you must make it possible. You know what your English newspapers are like. Well, think of the delight they'd have in dragging you down. You want me to withdraw the report and make a speech stating that I believe there are possibilities in the scheme. Those are my terms. I will give you any sum of money you want. <laughs> My dear Sir Robert, even you are not rich enough to buy back your past. No, I will not do what you ask. You I will not. Do. You must. If you do not, do. No, wait, wait, wait a moment. What, what did you propose? You, you said that you would give me back my letter, didn't you? Yes, that is agreed. I will be in the ladies' gallery tomorrow at half past eleven. If by that time, and you'll have had plenty of opportunity, you have made a speech in the terms that I wish, then I will hand you back your letter with the prettiest thanks and the best, or at least the most suitable compliment I can think of. And I intend to deal quite fairly with you. You must let me have time to consider your proposal. No. You must settle now. I have to telegraph Vienna tonight. What brought you into my life? circumstances. No, don't go. I consent. The report shall be withdrawn. I will arrange for questions to be put to me on the subject. Thank you. I knew we should come to an amicable agreement. I understood your nature from the first. And now you can get me my carriage. Englishmen always get romantic after a meal. That bores me dreadfully. Yeah. 
Well, dear Mrs. Cheveley, I hope you've enjoyed yourself. Sir Robert is most entertaining, is he not? Oh, most entertaining. Yes, I've enjoyed my talk with him immensely. He's had a very interesting and brilliant career. Also, he's married a most admirable wife. Oh, dear, I'm too old myself to bother about setting a good example. But I always admire people who do. <laughs> and now I must go, dear. Shall I call for you tomorrow? Thank you. Good night, my dear. Good night, dear girl. Good night, dear. Lady what a charming house you have, Lady Chilton. I've spent a delightful evening. It was so interesting getting to know your husband. Why did you wish to meet my husband, Mrs. Cheveley? Well, I wanted to interest him in the Argentine Canal scheme, of which I dare say you've heard. And I found him most susceptible. Uh, susceptible to reason, I mean. I convinced him in ten minutes. He's going to make a, a speech in the house tomorrow night in favour of the scheme. We must go to the ladies' gallery and hear him. It'll be a great occasion. But there must be some mistake. That scheme could never have my husband's support. Oh, I assure you it's settled. And now, <laughs> I don't regret my tedious journey from Vienna. Oh, but of course for the next 24 hours, the whole thing must be a dead secret. A secret? But between whom? Between your husband and myself. Your carriage is here, Mrs. Chief. Thank you. Good evening, Lady Chilton. Oh, good night, Lord Goring. I'm at Claridge's. Do you think you might leave a card? If you wish, Mrs. Chiefly. Oh, don't look so solemn about it. I may be obliged to leave a card on you. Uh, Sir Robert, will you take me to my carriage? Now that we have both the same interests at heart, we shall be the best of friends. What a horrid woman. Miss Mabel? You should go to bed. Lord Goring. Well, my, my father told me to go to bed half an hour ago, and I don't see why I shouldn't pass on the same advice. I always pass on advice. It's the only thing to do with it. It's never the slightest use to oneself. <laughs> Lord Goring. You're always ordering me out of the room. I think it's most courageous of you. Especially since I don't intend to go to bed for hours. <laughs> What's this? I wonder who dropped it. What a beautiful brooch. It is a bracelet. It isn't a bracelet, it's a brooch. It can be used as a bracelet. What are you doing? Miss Mabel, I'm going to make rather a strange request to you. Oh, pray do. I've been waiting for it all evening. I don't want you to tell anyone that I've taken charge of this bracelet. And if anyone should claim it, let me know at once. That is a strange request. Well, you see, I, I gave it to someone many years ago. You did? Yes. Well, then I shall certainly bid you good night. <laughs> good night, then. Good night, my dear. Good night. <laughs> Did you see whom Lady Markby brought here tonight? Yes. What has she come here for? Apparently to try and lure Robert to uphold some fraudulent scheme in which she's interested. Oh, I fancy she came to grief if she tried to lure Robert into her coils. <laughs> it is extraordinary what astounding mistakes clever women make. I don't call women of that kind clever. I call them stupid. Mm, <laughs> same thing often. Good night, Lady Chief. Good night. My dear Arthur, you're not leaving. Do stop a little. I, I want to talk to you. I'm afraid I can't, thanks. I promised I'd pop into the heart blocks on the way home. I believe they have got a mauve Hungarian band that plays mauve Hungarian music. I'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye. How beautiful you look tonight, Gertrude. Help me undo my dress. Robert, it isn't true, is it? You're not going to lend your support to this, this Argentine speculation. Who told you that I intended to do so? That woman. Mrs. Cheveley, as she calls herself. She seemed to taunt me with it. Robert, I know this woman. We were at school together. I despised her. She was sent away for being a thief. Mrs. Cheveley may have changed since then. 
No one should be judged entirely by their past. One's past is what one is. It is the only way by which people should be judged. Well, that is a hard saying, Gertrude. It is a true saying, Robert. And what did she mean by boasting that she got you to lend your support to a, to a thing that I have heard you describe as a most dishonest and fraudulent scheme? Oh, I was mistaken in the view I took, that's all. We all may make mistakes. But Robert, you told me yesterday that you had had the report from the Commission and that it entirely condemned the whole thing. I have reason now to believe that the Commission was prejudiced, or at any rate, misinformed. Robert, are you telling me the whole truth? Why do you ask such a question? Why do you not answer it? Oh, Gertrude, truth is a very complex thing. And politics are a very complex business. There are wheels within wheels. One may be under certain obligations to people that one must pay. Sooner or later in the political life, one has to compromise. Everyone does. Compromise? Robert, you? It is necessary. Vitally necessary. It can never be necessary to do what is not honourable. Oh, Gertrude. Robert, to the world as to myself, you have been an ideal always. We women worship when we love. Don't kill my love for you. Don't kill that. Is there in your life any secret disgrace or dishonor? Tell me. Tell me at once that... That what? That our lives may drift apart. Drift apart? It would be better for us both. Gertrude! There is nothing in my past life that you might not know. Oh, I was sure of it, Robert. But why did you say those dreadful things? Things so unlike your real self. Let us talk no more of the matter. You will write at once to Mrs. Cheverly, won't you, and tell her that you cannot support the scheme of hers. If you have given her any promise, then you must take it back. Now. Now? This moment. But it's so late. That makes no matter. Right here. She must know at once that she has been mistaken in you. That you are not a man to do anything base or underhand. Right? That you, uh, that you decline to support this scheme of hers as you hold it to be dishonest. Yes, write the word dishonest. She knows what that word means. Yes, that will do. Now the envelope. Letter sent at once to Claridge's hotel. There is no answer. Oh, Robert, I feel tonight that I have saved you from something. You have brought into the political life of our time a, a nobler atmosphere. I know it. And for that, I love you, Robert. Love me always, Gertrude. Love me always. I will always love you, because you will always be worthy of my love. We needs must love the highest when we see it. My dear Robert, it's a very awkward business. Very awkward indeed. But you should have told your wife the whole thing. No man should have a secret from his own wife. She invariably finds it out. Arthur, I couldn't tell my wife. I would have lost the love of the one woman in the world I worship. She would have turned from me in horror and contempt. And yet, after all, whom did I wrong by what I did? No one. Except yourself, Robert. Oh, Arthur, I was 22 at the time. Do you think it fair? That a man's whole career should be ruined for a fault done in his boyhood almost? <laughs> Life is never fair. And perhaps for most of us it is just as well that it is not. I had the double misfortune of being well born and poor. Every man of ambition has to fight his century with his own weapons. The god of this century is wealth. At all costs one must have wealth. But you could have succeeded just...